May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. I did not believe in the Bible. Yes, you heard me right. I do not believe in the Bible. What I do believe in is the God who is testified to in the stories in the Bible of the Hebrew people. What I do believe in is the witness in the Bible to the ever-present, ever-living God who became incarnate in the life and ministry, death and resurrection of Jesus the Christ. What I do believe in is the testimony given in the Bible to the reality of a God who still speaks to us today in our time and circumstance through the breath of the Holy Spirit. But I do not worship the Bible, for the Bible itself is not God. At best, the Bible is the biography of God, or as they say in the publishing trade, the authorized biography. My goal this morning, and in our conversations moving forward, is to help you see the difference between worshiping the Bible and worshiping God. How one attitude is nothing more than mere idolatry, if you will, but the other is the movement of the Spirit of God that indwells within each of us. And lastly, to help you ask faith-filled questions, of faith-filled questions of Scripture, of the Scriptures which so influence our lives. I believe this topic of the role of Scripture in our lives, how we are to regard and use and understand what the Bible says, and how we can ever know if we're on the right track is of paramount importance. Before we can even begin to consider the cosmic questions of our day, the deepening question of race relations, the epidemic of gun violence, all the tensions in the world, and yes, even the polarizing questions about human sexuality, before we can speak of any or all of these things, as we must, we need to understand what it is we are supposed to do with this book, the most loved, disputed, and influential writing of all time. For I do believe the answers that we seek are in the Bible, provided we let the Spirit speak and not impose our own preconceived notions. Some believe with all their heart that God composed every word of the Bible and that every line is true and accurate and once we accept that, life will become clearer. But others who are equally faithful would say that the Bible is the work of human minds, albeit inspired by God, and meant to be reinterpreted anew by each generation for the times in which we live. Looking at this difficult question of how we are to regard the Bible, is equally and especially important now for this church, the Church of St. John, as we begin the long and slow process of interpreting how human sexuality is treated in Scripture. And it is equally important for the national debate in which we find ourselves, in which many churches find themselves, as the legal framework of the country quite obviously tilts towards marriage equality even as a goodly segment of our population, perhaps even many of you here, react in fear of God's wrath. But detailed questions of sex and scripture are for another day. 
today and for some future Sundays and in the small group discussions that I hope will follow after worship, we are going to look as simply as we can at how to approach Scripture. Most of what I have to say is the product of my own study and research and thinking, but I intend to draw heavily on a book that I want to highly commend to you called Making Sense of the Bible, Rediscovering the Power of Scripture Today. It's written by a fellow named Adam Hamilton, who is the pastor of a large Midwestern Methodist church and the author of several spiritual works. Let me begin by stating a few obvious points to frame the discussion. And if these statements surprise you, we can discuss them in more detail in our small group after worship today. The first point is that the King James is not the original Bible. Beloved though it may be, the truth is there is no original text of the Bible, or at least to be thoroughly neutrally accurate, at least no original text has been found as of today. Most Hebrew writings, with a few exceptions, began as oral traditions that weren't thousands and thousands of years ago, that weren't written down until roughly about 600 years before the birth of Christ. And they were compiled during the time when the Jewish nation had been captured and scattered all over the Middle East, a time called the Babylonian exile when rabbis and scholars feared that their faith heritage, which spanned another 2,000 or so years prior to that point, was being forgotten. So they wanted to capture the, the tradition and the stories before too many generations had died off and nobody remembered the heritage. Secondly, there were no printing presses. The recorded stories of the Hebrew people were handwritten by multiple scribes using a variety of Middle Eastern languages that were later layered, in the case of the New Testament, by ancient Greek and then medieval Latin. So there is no one good translation even today. At best, what we have are translations of translations. But when you consider multiple hands and minds using many languages, telling the story of God, it should not be surprising that there are a number of troubling and confusing passages that emerge. Let me share a few. Consider, for example, Jesus' command in Matthew 5 to cut off your right hand if it causes you to sin or various passages in Exodus that command parents to execute, yes, kill their children. If they talk back, if they disobey, strike mom or dad, the penalty was death. Some may even squirm at the scary passages in Exodus 31 and 35, which declare that anybody who works on the Sabbath, on the seventh day, must be put to death. There are a whole range of passages that have been used to justify slavery, from Genesis and the supposed Noah's curse to sections of Exodus and Leviticus and even New Testament letters attributed to Peter and Titus and, and Paul, all speaking not in any kind of condemnation way about slavery. Deuteronomy and Joshua command annihilation of conquered peoples in ways that sound eerily ripped from today's headlines in the vicious atrocities of ISIS in the Middle East. Wipe them out. That's the biblical command. And on the domestic front, the Bible is full of laws and statements that define women as the property and servants of men.
even with passages that today would make the average person scratch their head and wonder or be repulsed. As late as 1978, we all remember 1978. For most of us, it wasn't that long ago. It seems like yesterday. Long after the discovery of dead, the Dead Sea Scrolls and developments in linguistics and archaeology, a group of 300 conservative evangelical theologians, biblical scholars, pastors, lay leaders from around the country, this country, met in Chicago to draft what became the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy. Let me just quote the summary sentence. Being holy and verbally God-given, Scripture is without error or fault in all its teaching, no less in what it states about God's acts in creation, about the events of world history, and about its own literary origins under God, than in its witness to God's saving grace in individual lives. Maybe so. Maybe so. But before you can say, that doesn't sound so bad, I would like to offer up two thoughts for you to consider as you wrestle with your own way to approach Scripture. The first is that a literal and infallible interpretation of the Bible too easily puts our still speaking God in a box from which even Houdini could not escape. As we used to say in the South, Elvis has left the building and he ain't coming back. That's not my idea of God. The notion that the Bible is of holy supernatural origin with every word dictated by God to biblical writers who acted as mere secretaries is problematic for two reasons. One, it mistakenly equates the written word of Scripture with the true word of God. There's only one true word of God that's testified to in the Bible. And as John told us in the Gospel reading, that word is Jesus, the one whom John says existed before the world began. The word of God is Jesus. And secondly, this idea of literal infallibility treats the word of God as a possession that's somehow under our control, as opposed to an act of God who speaks to humanity in the here and now, and will speak again through new testimony to each generation, through proclamation in other words and songs and actions, through the visible witness that God is actively involved in the world's trenches right with us in today's struggles. Then for me, to identify with a purely literal interpretation of the Bible means that all biblical texts, regardless of the topic, are leveled in importance. That all verses carry the same weight. So when this happens, when you look at it this way, the account of God from 1 Samuel to utterly destroy the Amalekites, their men, women, children, infants, and animals, the apostolic instruction that slaves should obey their masters, which is found in Ephesians, and that women should be silent in church, according to Timothy, are all vested with the same proclamation that God was in Christ, as 2 Corinthians tells us, and that in him there is a new and inclusive community, as we're told in Galatians. Seen in this light, the Bible is reduced to a deadening authoritarianism. Surely, surely, the good news that the tomb is empty has more weight and impact and influence and importance than what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah. If not, all we have done is reduce the Bible to this 
deadening same authoritarianism that creates this image of a book of rules, most of which are hopelessly outdated. So we tried to share with the kids a little while ago. Jesus loves me, for the Bible tells me so. You're not going to find that line anywhere in Scripture. But that is the message that comes through over and above the 630-some-odd rules in Leviticus that govern Jewish life 4,000 years ago. So then, what are we to make of all of these texts that seem to confound our moral sensibilities and confound our deep-seated hunger that most of us have for some simple clarity and the reassurance that we're doing and believing the right thing? The answer is that there is and always will be within the Bible the tension between multiple voices. And to sort through it all, we must not hesitate to interpret and reinterpret what we hear in the spirit of Jesus. You'll hear me talk more about this next week. But how many times have you heard in Scripture Jesus saying something like, you have heard it said, but I say, the point being, Jesus rewrote a lot of what we still regard as something we can't disobey today. Jesus rewrote a lot of the Old Testament. The Spirit of Jesus, the Risen One, speaks to us constantly. In the wisdom of the indwelling Spirit, the Spirit of God, who directs us to a presence that's hidden right before our very eyes. I want to share some words from another United Church of Christ pastor, Ron Farr, who expresses the thought far better than I can. And I'm quoting now. As we follow Jesus' footsteps, we are led directly into this tension among all the multiple voices in the Bible. We come to realize with Jesus that it is not heretical to say that some text or biblical voices are more important than others. Some texts express deeper layers of truth, and other ancient texts need to be reinterpreted according to those truths. How then do we discern? How do we tell which texts are more important and which ones are less important? Whatever we say represents the risk, the risk of biblical interpretation. We go out on a limb whenever we put forth our understanding of a text and conclude which texts are more important than others. This is a risk that we cannot avoid. We cannot shy away from if we are to be faithful. We cannot retreat into an overly simple literalism or doctrine of inerrancy we must interpret and sort out through the many contrasting voices with openness and humility. But at the same time, at the same time, we must, not be, we must be careful not to slip into a self-serving practice of just picking and choosing this scripture or that scripture that strokes our egos or puts down others whom we don't approve of. But we take the Bible seriously and respectfully, expecting that God will speak to us as we humbly wrestle with it. This is far talking now. We affirm that our imperfect but prayerful effort to unearth the treasures of Scripture is a life-changing process. It's not chucking stuff off a to-do list. It is done with an open heart, an open mind, and a hunger to know God's deepest intentions. So I pray this morning that I have given you a lot to think about. I hope I have shocked you. I really do. 
And I pray that you will be stirred to bring your questions into the lounge in a little bit to continue the discussion. If you look and are looking for simple, easy answers, you may be in the wrong place. Especially if all you're seeking is validation of long-held opinions that have little basis in biblical understanding or church tradition, but are imposed on us by the society in which we live. Sorting all these things out is hard. It's the heavy lifting of spiritual life in Christ. And we all need to be up to the challenge, or at the very least, moving forward in the trust of the one who calls us. Next week, as we continue on this theme of how to regard scripture, I will offer up for your consideration a handful of principles for interpreting the Bible. A checklist, sort of, of things to ask of yourself and of scripture as you seek to listen to the voice of our still speaking God. So until then, stay blessed. Amen.